Hi everybody, I'm Giuseppe Matulli. I'm a research scientist in geocomputation and spatial science. I'm affiliated with the Center for Research Computing at Yale University and also with the School of Forestry and Environmental Studies. Um, today I'm going to call, talk about high resolution digital elevation models and how we can use it to extract the geomorphology feature and hydrography. So I'm going to talk briefly um, about the digital elevation model, how we can build up the different kind and the different kind of um, technology that is behind how to build up a digital elevation model. And second, I will follow up with the geomorphometry and geomorphology analysis. And I will conclude with some example of how to derive a stream network instruction in basing, in, uh, for basin delineation. Okay, so topography complexity uh, in, in terms of science is the geomorphometry, geomorphology analysis, what is studied, the topography complexity, um, is, uh, can assume different forms, as you can see in this picture. Um, these are very uh, important to understanding and analyzing because the, the elevation and the shape of the forms of the earth, they are really behind different kind of um, environmental application. They can be responsible for species movement, species distribution, climate pattern, and also, for example, a sing single shape between a U and V valley can really uh, be important for different kind of er erosion application or flooding system model. Um, what is a digital elevation model? Digital elevation model is nothing else that uh, a scanning system, an elevation model, um, digital, so because is represent, is uh, represented in the computer domain, um, and can be captured is capturing the elevation of the Earth, and we will see the different applica different application and use, and how we can define and use it in this digital elevation model. Uh, there are mainly two different kind of, um, of data acquisition for digital elevation model. The first, one, the first one is by radar. So there is a scattering process of radar and wave, radar wave. And the second one is by laser input data, the so-called laser scanning. So um, this one was coming up as um, already 20 years ago. So it's the most common use it, but nowadays they're really bringing up about these LiDAR application and we will see the difference between the two of them. Um, one, one most important element that we have to consider when we talk about the global um, uh, digital elevation model uh, is the difference between, is the difference between surface model and terrain model. The different kind of application and system that we are using to, um, to build up a digital elevation model are able to capture a surface model when they capture the top of the terrain, or we can talk about terrain model when we are able to detect not only the surface, but also the information of the terrain model. Um, so it's very important when we talk about digital ele elevation model, we talk in a general term. Rather, if we talk about the surface model and terrain models, we can be more concrete in which kind of surface we are detecting. Um, the digital elevation model, they can come um, in a different form, and this different form, they can have uh, they, are, they, they, they have errors due to the processing and the, the, the acquisition. So um, in the radar scattering, in the, the one that are building up by radar, there are different kinds of noise, like um, pixel scatter, random noise that are due to the radar acquisition. They can be the presence of a stripe, for example, over here on the right side, or you can, you can have even absolute bias or error in the elevation, um, so all these kind of error they can be um, they can be uh, corrected based on different kind of, uh, for example, Fourier transformation or using ancillary data for um, correcting the, the bias of this error. Coming back to the digital elevation model, we can 
we can see two main differences of digital elevation model, and we can talk about digital surface model, in this case, the red one, the first one, and or we can talk about digital terrain model when we talk about the terrain. So the LiDAR is really uh, lighting image detection and ranging, uh, use ultraviolet visible or nearly infrared light to, to image object. So um, how it works, uh, this LiDAR is nothing, uh, is airplane base, so is running inputs of light and these inputs of input of light, they can really penetrate in the canopy cover and they can really detect the multidimensional space of the canopy. So that's why with LiDAR we can we can have a surface model, a terrain model. The surface model is produced by the, the input that are touched, they are scattered by a canopy, rather the, the other one, they are the, the one that are penetrate through the canopy and are able to arrive to the terrain. So if we are able to process this data, we can, we can get the digital, digital surface model and the digital terrain model. The surface model that you can see has more high elevation, rather the terrain model in the same area has less elevation. This is due because, this is due because in this area over here, the surface model is capturing the canopy cover, rather in the other one on the right side is capturing the, the terrain model. So of course you can have uh, a difference in elevation between um, between digital surface model and digital terrain model. All the different digital elevation models that are right, rather derived, like SRTM, most of them, they are, digital, they are considered, not most, they are considered as a digital surface model. So pay really attention about when you use SRTM as it is because you are using a digital surface model and not a digital terrain model. Anyway, there are different techniques that uh, the scientist has been using to, to correct uh, this kind of error. And we can see uh, one of the main product that has been uh, released one year ago and is, uh, has been corrected by this kind of error. So what you can, you can get in, uh, in the real term as a practical example. So for example, over here, you can see the digital surface model that is uh, taking, uh, is able to capture all the rooftop of these, um, this building. Rather, if you, talk, if you are able to remove this building, you can obtain the digital terrain model. There are different techniques that the, the research are being implemented to, to be able to, uh, to correct this, this error. So let's see um, which are the sources that are available in terms of digital elevation model at local and global coverage. So let's start first at local, uh, loc local level. Uh, USGS um, has been released a few years ago and this is still an ongoing program, the 3D elevation program, the 3DEP is called, is going to be complete in 2023. And this one is LiDAR based. Okay, so when is LiDAR based? Again, we can get detect information for terrain and surface model. So we, we are able, really able to detect a very high resolution terrain feature. As I mentioned, it's an ongoing project, so it's not full United States completely covered. Uh, then there is another open, uh, open, application, open application, open data portal, that is, is the open topography that is hosting all the, the, the different LiDAR data and topography in January. Um, and you can see it's very well covered for United States, but it's coming up also some, um, some different application in, uh, in different parts, including Europe and Asia. So from there, it's very easy. You can go there, you can zoom in this map, and you can download the, um, the topography data. Then there are other digital elevation models that are more um, global level. So for example, this is very new, has been released like one, uh, one month ago. So the, um, in the, the European Space Agency with the Copernic event, with the Copernic uh, program has been uh, released, the Copernicus that is uh, global, but also European. Uh, the global is uh, a 30, um, 
30 meter resolution, they have a version of 30 meter resolution and 90 meter resolution. And it's really a combination of different kind of sensor, optical sensor as uh, Aster, for example, SRTM, the one that I was mentioned before in the term that are radar base, uh, GM PED that is also radar base and different um, and the whole 3, 3D dam that is also um, radar base. So this one has been merged and, and mosaic together to obtain a digital elevation model. Uh, something to, uh, to consider, this one is still a surface model and not a terrain model. Rather, in 2019, Dai Yamazaki make a big effort in, uh, um, in merging uh, and using SRTM and uh, a Japanese sensor to, um, to create the first global high resolution digital elevation model that can be considered as a terrain model because with a, uh, with a different kind of application and uh, analysis like Fourier transformation and, uh, and, and so on, he was able to remove the canopy cover effect and also to um, reduce the kind of error and noise that were in, inserted, they were present in the SRTM, like the stripe, the spikes and so on. Later on, one, uh, one year later, so in, uh, in, in 2019, he also released the Merit Hydro. Merit Hydro is a digital elevation model, but adjusted, to, uh, uh, adjusted by um, hydraulic for hydraulic analysis, and they are able to use to extract the hydrography at global context. We will see how these the two terrain, uh, uh, terrain model has been used and I was using to, to, to create this geomorphometry feature. So let's see how we, we are going to use geomorphometry feature by means of the merit, by means of merit data. So geomorphometry and geomorphology analysis, the science behind to, uh, to study the shape of the, of the earth. As you can see, there are different kind of um, um, shape and this one there are just capturing um, the different microclimate and microclimate that are present in, uh, in they are able to, 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 to representing and influence also the species distribution around there. So the science that is um, behind this stu uh, study and um, analysis of, uh, um, of this form is called geomorphometry or geomorphology analysis. And the features that are able to capture and detecting and extract are geomorphometry feature. So let's see in practice what, what does it mean and how we can derive this information from that digital vision model. Um, so if you think in a three-dimensional way, um, a simple slope, a simple profile can be characterized by different uh, lines that, and in according to this line, how they move, you can identify the, 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 the simple slope like this one. So the changing of elevation in the, in the deepest uh, direction, or you can see also the changing, of, uh, the changing of the curvature in the horizontal direction. In this case, we will talk about tangential cur curvature, or we will, we, you can talk again about, about the changing of the slope. So the, in the, deepest in the beast deepest uh, direction and you can talk about profile curvature, cur curvature then you can have also the first order partial derivatives can okay, nothing else than the changing in the north south direction and also the changing as a second order partial derivative in the east and west direction um, i've been working for several years already in topography and have been released this data set in, in 2018 at the global level. But we can see that uh, nowadays is also, uh, there is something new that I just released and you will be one of the few to, uh, to see this, uh, uh, this new data set. Um, this is the context of uh, a single dimension, the two dimensional changing, but in the moment that you, you combine all these, all these profile curvature, tangential curvature, or first order derivative and so on, you talk about different kind of or geomorphology form or geomorpho. Uh, so you can identify like, for example, flat and peak 
ridge and shoulder, spur and slope, and so on. So uh, this figure is really immediately uh, let you understand that the, the, we can identify peaks and ridge in a very immediately way. So let's see in the context of a global implementation how these maps, how these curvature, these elements are represented in the uh, and how we can use it. Um, so using the merit dam, I was releasing. Uh, I'm releasing has been just right now accepted one week ago in scientific data the so-called geomorphone 90 meter data set. Um, the geomorphone 90 meter data set is a combination of um, is an extraction of geomorphometry feature um, from the merit to them. Um, so uh, how I built, let's see how what I built and how we can derive this information. So if you think about a, a, a normal digital elevation, digital elevation model that you use so many times, you can derive, for example, different roughness indices or different curvature. The roughness indices are nothing else than how the, the surface is rough, the, how much up and down you have in the topography. Rather, the curvature are the one that you, I mentioned before, and over here you can see a, represent a, a, a 3D representation like concavity and convexity and so on. So as you can in, imagine, uh, these are also very important for different kind of erosion application or even accumulation of water and accumulation of soil. So for example, this one can be really important for these and these for accumulation in this valley. Rather, these one are more um, they don't accumulate so fast, or so even this one, they don't, do not let accumulate the water. So over here, you can imagine that is uh, building up a microclimate for some species that are very important. So it's uh, really fundamental. It's very important to insert this kind of feature inside your species distribution model to be able to uh, identify the micro niche. Because when you use the temperature and when you use uh, precipitation or temperature at, with um, as a climate data, they are not able to capture, these data are climate coming from climate model, so they are not able to capture really microclimate situation. They are useful for one kilometer resolution, maybe you can arrive to 500 meter resolution, but how you can identify the microclimate situation is more, you can use it as a proxy, the different geomorphometry analysis. So let's see the, the implementation at global level, what they look, how they look like. So um, if you think how the curvature is represented in the, in the landscape, you can imagine immediately these um, 2D, 2D, 3D dimension that you can see immediately that the red part are the, the, the ridge, rather the valley is the blue part. So, by this, you can distinguish and you can insert in the model the position of your uh, microclimate situation with using valley or ridge in the, in the model. So let's see some applications. For example, the roughness build up a, a global, uh, global level. So the amount of up and down situation that I was mentioned before. You can have different kind as a curvature immediately as a profile curvature, you can see, or as a tangential curvature. Again, the profile curvature is the horizontal change, rather um, the, the tangential curvature is the, the vertical change. Uh, actually, it's the opposite, sorry. This one is the horizontal change, and this one is the, the vertical, the, the profile change. And you can see that, of course, the, the most, um, the, the area with the highest level of profile profile and tangential curvature are the, the mountain areas. So already this one, they are able to, to tell you uh, which kind of um, area are more prone to curvature and tangent, uh, yeah, profile curvature and tangential curvature. Let's move to the second one, yes, okay. Um, so uh, these one are, not, are, are the so-called geo, uh, geomorph uh, geomorphological landform that I was mentioned before. So you can see that you can calculate, you can have it maps where each single ridge, peaks, and so on is calculated as a percentage 
of the uh, of the value how many you have in the pixel so this one can be used not only not only as a continuous variable as a 0 to 100 as a percentage of each class or you can use it as a categorical variable when you have 12 classes all together in only one map so all the different variables uh, they can express uh, some important information inside to, from the digital elevation model and in according to the uh, to the, te the statistical technique that you are going to use it you have to be able to um, to select the one that are more responsible for your species distribution you have to be careful that some of them are really high correlated between them so like you can see all the one that are really scatter it together so all the different um, curvature and their um, changing of aspect changing of sign curvature changing of the slope and so on these are very high correlated uh, rather some other are less correlated so be careful when you are using the different uh, species distribution model you have to be able to select the, the right one and to avoid collinearity inside of the variable anyway this is also um, a point that uh, the collinearity of variable is not really needed, let's say, uh, in, in some kind of machine learning algorithm like random forests that is able to deal with collinearity of variable. So if you are doubting which variable and sometimes quite often um, the different variable, the different variable, they, are, they can be very high correlated um, very high correlated in some area but inverse correlated in some other area a typical example that i do it is for example the uh, the changing of elevation and the changing of temperature elevation and temperature they, they are extremely high correlated you you go high in elevation you uh, you have less uh, the temperature is going down but actually what is happening in the valley in mountain areas is completely the opposite so by removing one of these two variables you are not able anymore to capture the difference in the, what is happening then in the valley that you have the invert or inverse effect, effect because the, the cold area is going down and is uh, sitting in the valley especially without when there are no wind uh, so in the machine learning environment you are able to use both variable also uh, also that if they have high collinearity um, so then there are some other variables like the aspect that due to that is a circular variable uh, you can transform it you can use the cosine and the sine to use it inside a different kind of model that they deal it with um, with continuous variable and not with the circular variable um, these new data set these new data set are available already available in open topography um, so has been uh, not been released as but they are open so you can navigate directly to open topography and you can download it uh, so again at, they are at 90 meter resolution um, they have been corrected use it the merit them so we talk about merit them is a terrain model and not a surface model uh, so you can really use it is one of the best um merit dam is one of the best digital elevation model terrain model and also so therefore also the the topography variable that i um derived they are really high accurate so this is something that you can already use it in your distribution model if you scrolling down into the web page you can you can have a little graphical user interaction for downloading the full data set and then you can um, that you can download it in tiles of course because they are quite big and you can start to use it in uh, in your processing routine they have been saved as a as a tiff file and you can import it directly in r or uh, in grass or in other command line um, command line uh, language uh, now let's move it a bit from uh, from the uh, from the geomorphometry analysis and let's move it to the string nectar extraction and also Bayesian delineation. The digital elevation model uh, is extremely useful to derive this element of hydrography. Okay, so as I mentioned before, 
uh, the, the digital elevation model is good, but there is also, there are also other information that can tell us, like the satellite image that can tell us where there is presence of water. Um, so uh, Pikel in 2017 released the first map of water occurrence at global level with the 30 years of observation lands at the arrival. Uh, so 30 meter resolution. Uh, so they tell us when there was water, but the presence of water doesn't tell uh, about in which direction uh, the water was moving. In other words, there was not any information about which river is connected to which one. Moreover, in the moment that the river is becoming very small, you lose this in kind of information. So you are not anymore to be able to track down where are the presence of, river, of rivers. Rather on the opposite, the, the, the digital elevation model, thanks to the, to the natural phenomena that the water goes always on the steepest slope, you can identify the flow direction, so you can calculate different hydrological parameters like a flow accumulation, drainage direction, and also derive consequently the presence of the channel. Uh, pay attention, I say the presence of the channel, I didn't say uh, really the presence of water. Indeed, you cannot identify if there is water or not because you can have a valley but without water, like in desert area. So it's thanks to the presence or the combination of these two elements that you can identify the presence of water in a determinate in a, in a, in a stream in a in a valley area. So um, and in, indeed, um, Dai Yamataki uh, released the Merita Hydro in uh, one year ago in 2019, and by the combination of water current as a satellite image, as I mentioned, or even as an open street map, so citizen crowdsourcing, was able to correct the digital elevation model um, and, and having a very high accurate um, digital uh, corrected, uh, uh, hydrographically correct digital elevation model that can be used to extract hydraulic feature. So I am in the process of uh, uh, do this massive computation for extracting this feature. And nowadays, uh, now I can show you in which context is um, we are able to, uh, do in which the project is present. Um, so one of the main sources of uh, identify a stream is the flow accumulation algorithms. Uh, the flow accumulation is nothing else that the amount of area that is on top of a determin uh, determining point. So you can think about one point over here and you can draft that all this area is going down into the valley and is bringing water over there. So is the amount of area that is contributed to that, that determinant pixel. There are different kinds of algorithms that uh, all of them, they, they use this phenomenon that the water goes in the deepest direction but they can have a slight different in according to if you have one direction, the water goes in only one direction or is it sprayed also in the other pixel and so on. Uh, so in, in according to the different flow accumulation algorithm that use it, you can have a slight different presence of channel. Or, uh, yeah, they also call it stream. Okay, but more or less they are always in the in the valley. They can move a few pixels left and right, but they, they are able to locate exactly locate in the valley. Um, so if you compute the full globe extent, and this is uh, this is this is the first time that has been computed, and is an ongoing project that, that I'm running out. Uh, you can identify each single basin catchment at global level. Um, this has been done uh, in the supercomputer at Yale, and if you are able to zoom inside each single catchment, you can see the subcatchment of each single stream, uh, same stream and substream, and you can identify that each single subcatchment can be a unit for the different kind of application that you can use it for soil erosion or for uh, species distribution or other kind of um, element. And inside this one can be used as a computational unit to derive other parameters. 
So you can calculate the amount of water in this subcatchment or the, the mean of temperature in the subcatchment and so on. You can have a really accurate um, stream network like the black one, for example, is the one derived directly derived by the digital elevation model that if you combine with a hydro shed, that is the one that is current available at global level, you can see that you can detect a very much better details. And these details are not far away for the, from the NHD plus that is the one built from, from USGS for United States territory. So it is an ongoing project. This one will be ready in, in probably one year. Um, and I'm going to release all these stream network that are in the um, ready to use inside um, inside different soft, uh, particular software like Grass. And indeed, how, uh, how you can use it, how you can build up all these variable. These are really computational intense work. Uh, is not something the global level 90 meter that you can do it in a in a laptop computer, but also in a supercomputer like the one that we have at Yale, you have to be able to use command line routines. And uh, in among these command line routines, I'm using a lot of GDAL MPK tools for the massive preprocessing, and then GRAS for the geomorphometry, uh, geomorphometry and uh, for the stream network delineation. Um, and this one, of course, are all present in, the, in a Linux computer, and you have to build up really processing line to be able to compute all these variable working tiles and understanding manager, the memory management and so on. Um, and you have to be able also to extract the different kind of um, statistical analysis also for error reporting so also the use of R in combination of all this language is very efficient to take out the statistical uh, yeah bringing bringing the statistical analysis inside to these um, to this routine um, these are not very easy uh, easy task that's why um, I have um, I, I maintaining the spatial ecology. That's why I maintain the spatial ecology website, where I storing plenty of data, plenty of exercise and example how to use GDAL PK tools, um, GRASS, Python, R for massive pro uh, massive processing of geographic data. In particular, I was pointing to you, uh, pointing to you the one that explaining how to use GDAL MPK tools, and also the one that explained how to use GRASS. And you have also a tutorial, a tutorial with exercise, but also a video where I, uh, I explain uh, the structure of GRASS that is quite um, difficult to start, especially in the beginning. Uh, in addition to the to the material, I'm also organize intensive training in geocomputation that then they can apply to species distribution, to geology, uh, to animal movement, and a different kind of application. Uh, we have been um, almost around the world. Uh, we are missing a bit of Asia, but uh, we move it quite well in between Europe and uh, in the United States, and sometimes we also go to developing country. Uh, where we can, they can use these open source tools without any kind of license constraints. And so for them, it's very appealing, uh, this kind of uh, having, bringing up tools uh, that later on they can also use it even after the, the, the course is over. Uh, in this context, I'm organizing um, two intensive training um, from the May 11 to 15 in Yale University. Another one, in Matera in the first week of June. Both of them, they are uh, bringing geocomputation uh, to the, uh, for application of environmental analysis for open source. So uh, please navigate to this, um, this web, pa web page. If you want additional information, feel free to, to write me an email and you can follow me on um, Big Data Ecology and Twitter and you can also see the different application and exercise that I was mentioned to you in the spatialecology.net. Um, I'm going to send you an email about this information so you will have also um, in the next week when the, the two um, 
workshop that will be um, available and sponsored to all the food community. So that's it for this uh, digital elevation model introduction. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. And I will be online for potential question and rising up um, doubts and so on. So see you live. Thank you very much. <laughs>